Well, we're going to start off really strong today, and we have the chair of our sociology department, Dr. Nancy Yoon. <laughs> you know, she just uh, wrote a book called Real Inequality, and we're going to unpack some of the research that she has, uh, has been studying for the last 17 years, and we're going to try to connect that with our, our Christian faith as well. Okay, so Nancy, what what was some of the things that you wanted to bring out in the book, and why was that so important for you as a as a as a sociologist, but also a Christian sociologist, to make sure that we can hear in the wider audience? Hi everyone, so glad to see you here on a Friday rainy morning. <laughs> um, so when I wrote this book, um, this was yeah, I started the research in 2000. So I was always interested in, um, in representation, right? I, um, I grew up um, in Long Beach. Uh, anyone here from the LBC? Woo! Woo! There you okay, go. So, so um, I immigrated here actually when I was five to, to Long Beach. And I grew up um, a latchkey kid. Um, Mike and I were talking about we were both latchkey kids. That's right. Um, and so the television was my babysitter. and and my socializer, right? So I, um, I came to this country, I didn't speak any English, I watched TV, I actually remember uh, Mr. Rogers, is that like way too old for you guys? <laughs> Dan, there's something called Daniel Tiger now. Daniel Tiger is like a cartoon yes. version of Mr. Rogers. Yes, yes, I actually know that one. It's not, not the same, not, not the same, the, oh, not the okay. same. So I used to, my grandmother and I, we used to call him the guy who put on his sweater and took and like would change his That's sweater right, yeah. and shoes because we didn't know Mr. Rogers. But um, and Sesame Street, so I learned English and Spanish like at the same time. And <laughs> and so it was a, it was a big socializer, right? So what I noticed as I was getting older was that there was this kind of discrepancy between kind of Long Beach where I grew up, where there were refugee kids, there were you know African Americans, Latinos, Latinas, and 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 then television was was completely white, right? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. never saw myself represented. And um, and I think as I grew older, I just became really interested in, in representation. I think that as a Christian, you know, we are we're made in God's image, but then Hollywood uh, only represents some you know, populations of us and not others. And that, that makes a big difference because it's about significance, right? Who is, who is worthy of a story to be told? Right. And when that story is missing on screen, um, it affects the way that we see ourselves and that we see one another. And that, as a Christian, that's concerning to me because then we're not really seeing the full breadth of God's creation. Great, great. You know, um, it seems to me that Hollywood portrays itself to be progressive and to be liberal in some sense. Uh, to be all for diversity. You know, what does your research show about this and how might that mm -hmm. not be the case? So Hollywood, uh, so as a sociologist, we look at things not at the individual level, but at um, what's called the institutional level. And Hollywood is a big institution, right? Yeah. And, and societal level as well. And, and the funny thing about racism and sexism and inequality is that it's, it's everywhere, right? So right. Hollywood might think of itself and, and kind of um, package itself or market itself as this very inclusive environment. But as we know, as some of you guys may know, um, Oscar So White was the last, last two years. This year, actually, there are Actors of Color nominated. Um, and that, that shows that Hollywood is, in fact, um, part of the system, right? And, and people have biases, people who, on the left and the right, right? We're all born into a society that is uh, sinful in terms of um, not being able to, uh, you know, be equal to everybody in terms of um, the way that we're raised. We don't even think of each other, I think, equally. But this is all, I think, back then it used to be okay to think, of, think that way openly, um, back, you know, pre-civil rights. Um, and now I think we, we don't recognize that, that we all harbor those biases still, right? Even if we think of ourselves not as racist, um, in fact, because of, partly because of Hollywood and just our, our family of origin, the way we're socialized, all that still contributes to us not um, being able to see each other completely equally. In fact, we, we have stereotypes, right? We have stereotypes right. of people, and sometimes um, we don't even recognize them. Like I, who, you know, I've written this book, I've, um, 
I've you know, studied this, I've, I've, I've gotten a PhD, and I was watching this show called Queen Sugar, um, which, is, uh, which is a show on, on the o, o, uh, Oprah's network. Okay. It's by Ava DuVernay, and there was a scene in, in, the, um, in the show where I was watching, and I knew that the, that the show was about an African-American family, right? But there's a scene where you have an African-American custodian who's polishing the floor, and then a white male who is in a business suit with a briefcase walking towards the camera, right? So you see the custodian, and you see the, the guy walking, and he actually walks past the camera, right? Right. keeps going, and then the camera focuses on the African-American custodian who's yeah. polishing the floor. And I yeah. was shocked, because I was expecting the story to be about that other guy, because yeah. you're so used to it. It's not just, it's just not, not just race and gender, but it's class as well, right? We're used to right. stories about wealthy, powerful people. Think about, like, the wolves of Wall Street and th things, you know, things like that. There's, there's very few stories about the marginalized in Hollywood, right? Those kind of stories are, um, are less told. So, so I recognize that I had that biases, that I had, I had that bias even though I've, right. I've critically examined media because those biases are so ingrained and we can't help ourselves but see, see everybody through those lenses. Yeah. You know, what, what is so wrong about underrepresentation? You know, why can't we just think, you know what, I might not be on the screen, but you know, I can live out my own life. And mm -hmm. what, what does that do when I don't see myself on the screen as, as much or people yeah. like me? Yeah, so, um, so research shows, so psych psychological studies show that young people, and we know that young people are, are consuming media at enormous rates, right? People kind of use the television as babysitters, as, you know, latchkey kids know. Right. And so, um, so they, they actually showed that um, there was a study of um, white boys and girls and black boys and girls, and they looked at self-esteem and number of hours of television consumed. And with every increased number of hours, um, the, the white girl, the black boy, and the black girl, all their self-esteem went down huh. for every additional hour of television consumed. So, so these are things that maybe we can think that, oh, yeah, well, I, I, can, I see other people in my life that are doing good things. Like, you know, I, you know, I, I see... Um, if I were like Latina, there's like, you know, there's Sotomayor who's like, you know, the Supreme Court justice, I can aspire to that. But if I'm not seeing anybody on a day-to-day -day basis, especially as a child, just even knowing that one single person, that's not enough to kind of make me feel like confident, right? There's actually a study that just came out, if anybody read it, that girls as young as age six already associate their genders um, not with brilliance. Huh. So as young as at age five, they're still like, yeah, girls, girls rule. Yeah. But by age six, they're already like, oh, you know, yeah, girls are not as brilliant as boys. My so, daughter's six. You just broke my heart. Yeah. <laughs> so that study literally just came out this past week. So, so um, media has a lot to do with that, right? And um, that's why it's important. And also, the other thing is that, so not just um, self-esteem of, of, you know, not seeing oneself represented, but also how you see other people, right? So research also shows that when you have no contact with a certain group, which is actually a lot of us, um, America is still very segregated in terms of social circles. And so then you, you kind of use television and film to, to draw conclusions about people, even if it's not conscious, right? But when you think about it, um, uh, there was, a, there was a, actually a, a radio show that, um, that uh, a UCR professor um, described this phenomenon really well. He said that if you've never seen an airplane in real life, and all you watch is the news, all you see are crashes, right? <laughs> so you think that all airplanes do are crash. You never see airplanes landing or taking off safely. You only, in the news, only, you know, shows you the crashes. So that's all you, so then you associate that with airplanes, right? Right, right. So, um, so the same thing happens when you, you know, if you're only seeing, like, um, Asian Americans as nerds or African Americans as criminals or uh, Latinos as, you know, illegal, you know, um, aliens then that is, that influences, that impacts the way that we see things. All of us, even those of us who uh, maybe have some contact with those, those groups, it's still, it still influences us, especially since um, research also shows that we're consuming like 15 and a half hours of media per day. I mean, that is... Whoa, that's that, like, well, I'm sleeping too then, huh? <laughs> well, if you combine like social media and, you know, watching film and television, which it's all kind of like... Right? It's, it all melds together now, right? Because yeah. everything is kind of on, on the phone or on, um, on, you know, on a small screen. So, yeah, so we're consuming so much media and all that impacts the way that we see the world. Yeah, so it's like we absorb these images and we kind of like think that becomes our reality in some sense. Is that mm -hmm. fair to say? 
well, we don't even consciously know it. It just yeah. becomes our reality, right? It becomes yeah. the way that we perceive people, especially, again, if we don't know anyone in real life or we just have minimal contact, right? Even if I just have one good friend, one, you know, if I have one, if I'm like, um, if I have one Latina friend, right? And I think, okay, I know everything there is to know about Latinas, right? But, you know, the, in fact, one friend does not make me, you know, therefore very conscious about, about the different experiences because, you know, as we know, we are God's created us in all this, all these diversity, and and just in you, know, you and I, probably, even though we both look similar <laughs> as Asians, <laughs> I would imagine that we have different ideas and different experiences. Absolutely. I mean, we don't even speak the same language of origin, right? You're Korean American, yeah. Korean, so, yeah. so you know, Asians don't speak the same language, right? So, or, surprise. <laughs> I mean, English, <laughs> but but I think the idea that Asia, you know, Asian American, like it, there are so many different languages and and yeah. cultures, and in fact, in our countries of origin, we all hate each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so coming here to be kind of all lumped into one group, it's, um, it's, it's very odd, yeah. right? And, and Hollywood certainly does not distinguish between, between groups. There was one, um, one actor I interviewed, he, he's Chinese-American, and he was asked to do a Japanese-American, no, he was, he was uh, auditioning for a Japanese mafia role, so he has to, they asked him to do a Japanese accent. So he was like thinking, okay, who is like this classic Japanese actor? Oh, Toshio Mifune, who's in like the classic Japanese, like what does he sound like when he speaks English? <laughs> so he brought that authenticity, and then the casting director, who is a, a white Jewish woman, who was like, no, that's not the Japanese accent I'm looking for. So then he thought, okay, what is she looking for? Probably a stereotype, you know, accent. So then he does the stereotype, you know, kind of more like, I mean, it's not even Chinese, but I think it's typically thought of as. Yeah, yeah. So, and he did that, and she's like, that's the Japanese accent I was looking for, <laughs> right? So, 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 so the, the, these, I, so what, it's funny, because even actors of color have to, what they're portraying on mm, screen yeah, are, are a stereotype vi version of what right. we're used to. And, and that Asian accent actually came out of, the origins of that Asian accent came out of, um, the old, old like images of, of white actors in yellow face, right? That, mm -hmm. That's where those accents actually came from. Some, some white actor making up what they thought an Asian should sound like. And that's the accent that now Asian Americans wow. have, or Asian actors have to conform to, right? right? In order to get roles. So, so that's, that's the level of unreal portrayals that are on TV so, wow. and, and film. All right. Well, let's jump right into it, and we're going to answer a few questions from our audience today. Awesome. Here we go. I want to be more critical about what I watch, but I am new to the conversation. What are some stereotypes of people groups that we can watch out for and be aware of? And then, how to fight against stereotyping in real life? That's a really great what question. What a great question. Well, I do teach a film and television class, and we go through all the stereotypes of people groups, actually, in detail. Um, so let me think if I could just give like a... Can you highlight a few of them? Yeah. Yeah. So I could, I'll start with the Asians, right? So, um, so I don't offend anybody immediately. <laughs> so, so these are stereotypes, right? Because I actually posted something on Facebook uh, about our students like mapping out the different stereotypes, and I and I had people be offended that I called out the stereotypes because they think that I'm stereotyping. You know, just yeah. seeing them is is harsh. So. Um, so I think Asian Americans um, and Latinas, Latinos um, and, and also Arab slash Middle Easterners all get the foreigner stereotype, right? So obviously, I, the thing about accents, though, I am speaking with an accent. I think it's probably a Valley Girl, Southern Californian <laughs> accent. We are all accented peoples, right? So, Especially in California. <laughs> yes. We, yeah. Yes. Well, it's hard because California, I think sometimes we export our accents. You kind of, like on the news, it sounds kind of like California. So we think that yeah. that's standards. Like in England, it's like Her Majesty's English or something, right? So, um, but we are all accented. But then we tend, and then, and then so not only are they accented, so, so my example of the authentic accent is actually not the accent that people are looking for in Hollywood in terms of casting. They're looking for a stereotype accent. And what is that stereotype accent? It's to demean, right? It's to, it's to laugh at, right? Years ago, I invited, actually, I invited, uh, there was a CMA chapel, a, a film department chapel, and I invited a friend who is Japanese-American, and he was talking about his experiences and how he 
And, he, and he, t he said that he actually did a great John Wayne impersonation. So he did a, a, like a country western accent. And you know, everybody in the audience were quiet. And then he was talking about how he was expected to do, like maybe you know, a few minutes later, that he was expected to do an Asian accent. And he actually did it. And then, and then everyone laughed. But he was actually giving an example of how problematic it was, but then people laughed at him doing the Asian accent. And at the end of the chapel, everyone's like, oh, hey, what are some closing thoughts? And I was like fuming inside. I was like, so the last word that I had was like, you guys need to examine what you find funny because that wasn't funny, you know? Or yeah. why do you find that funny? Like the fact, so, so recognizing, okay, what are the stereotypes that, what are the things that I expect of each group when I'm watching? And do I find things that are funny that really aren't funny, right? right. And, and broken English, someone speaking broken English, someone is trying to learn the language, right? And to laugh at someone speaking broken English, I mean, that's pretty, that's, that's, that's not yeah. nice, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. But that's how Hollywood kind of, it, 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 it sticks in the foreigner yeah. as the stand-in for comic relief. Yeah. But we're laughing at someone, you know, who's, who's just coming to, I mean, it's not even, it's a stereotype, but, but but behind it is the idea that somebody who is struggling and coming, you know, trying to assimilate into this country yeah. is funny. Well, can I ask a question off of that? Yeah. Yeah, what about shows like Fresh Off the Boat, you know? I mean, it's, it's a show about immigrants, and the parents definitely have some sort of accent. Is that a bad representation? Is that an underrepresentation? Like, what, what do you think about a show like Fresh Off the Boat? Yeah, so I think a show like Fresh Off the Boat, um, when there are more than one representation of a group, you can have maybe someone who is accented, but then when you have someone who is not accented, yeah. then your, our brains are able to process that, oh, not all Asians have accents, right? Got it. Um, and even Randall Park, who plays the father, I've heard that um, he's lost the accent this season. Oh, really? <laughs> so he's assimilated really quick, you know? <laughs> but I think the actor himself, he's, he's Korean-American playing a Taiwanese-American um, right. first-generation immigrant. Um, like, he had to have accent coach, right? Actually, all of them had to have accent coaches, which is ironic. But, um, but they're trying to do authentic accents, and I think he just, he just gave it up, because, you know, so then, voila, he's assimilated. But, um, but, but the idea is that when you have more than one, when we have a whole cast of Asian Americans, you, you see the grandmother who is, you know, who can't speak English, right? And then you have the mom who speaks with an accent. You have the kid who speaks, I mean, he's trying to be like, you know, like hip and urban. Um, and, and, then, so, and then you have like the nerdy little kids who also speak with no accents. So you have a variety. So some of it does reinforce um, stereotypes and, and I think we're not there yet for Asian Americans, unfortunately. Um, but at least there are characters in there that are full, there's a full breadth of representation and, and you also empathize with them, they're protagonists, right? It's the worst when they're the stereotype and they just walk in, walk off, and you never see them again, versus someone who's a protagonist and you follow the series, you identify with that, with that character. So then you actually, when you identify with that character, you, you are stepping into their shoes, you are having empathy, and you think like, oh, I, I understand that, that group a little bit better, you know? Great. All right, let's go to the next question. Okay, this is from Samantha. She asks, how do you respond to the often unjustified point mm -hmm. that white actors are the quote unquote most qualified and talented over minorities? Yeah, no, no, that's a common, um, actually the more common is that we couldn't find enough talented, we couldn't find, we couldn't find you know, actors of color who are ready, right? They right. don't usually say whites are more qualified in, in Hollywood because that does sound a little more racist, but, um, but, but it's the same thing where they say like, oh, we couldn't find them, you know? So I was interviewing a talent agent and she was like, yeah, we have the hardest time again using Asians, but you know, this, this could apply to any um, underrepresented group, um, any group of color. Um, it w they were like, oh, we can't find Asians. We just can't find them. And I was like, oh, did you look at East West Players, which is the premier um, Asian American theater group in LA? She's like, what's that? So she didn't even know what East West Players are. So they're not looking very hard, right? Uh, yeah. and, and so and when, when there aren't enough roles written um, for actors of color, so actors of color are not actually performing enough roles. So then people don't know them, right? People will know, they can, they can think of actors off the top of their heads because some actors work more than others, right? So it's just, it's a, it's a, mad, it's a numbers game, right? Yeah. But it's a numbers game that, that then they transfer into talent, right? Oh, there's not enough, but they don't know, they're not looking hard enough. This is a problem with diversity in all kind of occupations where um, people are, you know, people, 
that there's, there's people who have a lot of social networks, right? So they're in there and they know it and, um, and they know how to get in there. But, but the people who haven't been let in, they're not part of those social networks. So you have to really, you know, you have to go out of your way to find them. Doesn't mean that they don't exist, but it's because there's been barriers. So right. if there have been barriers, how are they supposed to jump the barrier and get known, right? If you're right. not actually lifting the barrier and you're not going around the barrier to look for them. Right, right, yeah. great. Let's ask, let's ask her another one. What will correct representation in media look like? What measurement can act accurately tell us when we've gotten there, and what institutional changes are necessary to make it happen? That's a tough question. That's a really good one. <laughs> okay, so correct representation. Well, um, when I wrote my book, um, so as an academic, when I published my book, I had to have other academics read it and say, okay, it's good to go, you can publish it. I had three yeah. rounds of this, and one round, there was a film, prof uh, a film theater professor who said, because I, I was saying, okay, if we just get like the, right, the, the, number, the, the number of people on screen match the number in population. Like, okay. then we're good to go. And she's like, no, because what if they're all stereotypes? Got right? It. So, so like a show like Empire, right? Empire is hugely popular, and I think it's so important to have lots of representations. But when, you know, everybody on that show is like, you know, falls into stereotypes, so you can say this about Fresh Off the Boat and Blackish and all these other shows too, um, then we're not there yet, right? But then you have shows like Insecure, and you have shows like Queen Sugar, you have shows that are, that are, um, that are more, that go deeper, that are more drama, and I think it's the sitcoms, right? The sitcoms yeah. and the, I mean, or, or the kind of like melodramas that, are, that those genres themselves are exaggerated, right? They're yeah. one-dimensional, and so, so the likelihood of those stereotypes are, are, are reinforcing stereotypes. So, so it's like when people of color are actually in all the different genres, just like whites, right? So it's like a, it's equal opportunity representation, then you're able to kind of um, get past the, oh, well, they're like this kind of um, mentality. So I think that right. that's when, um, that's when we're, and, and that we're not having these conversations about, oh, you know, we need more diversity in this area where, or, or there's, so like where Hollywood would stop saying, oh, well, that's a black movie. Only black people are going to go see that. You know, because that is, that is a mentality. Got it. Um, there is um, Master of None, which is a show on Netflix, talks about when there's yeah. more than one Indian on TV, that that's like <laughs> an ethnic film that's foreign, right? Because right. you can't see more than one, you know, South Asian on TV because that's not American anymore, which, is, which is, goes back to the whole foreigner problem, right? So where we see everybody as, oh, it's just a matter of fact. And, and yeah. they're not necessarily all the same, that they, they bring their cultural uniqueness yeah. and that's just, that's just television or that's just film. Great. Is it fair to say then, like underrepresentation in some sense limits the way that we want to approach other people's stories and we don't even want to listen to their story in some sense and better representation in some sense will help us be more open to, to understanding a, a wider perspective that we might not have even thought of. I think that um, as you were just talking, I realized sometimes people don't want to tell their stories because people have stereotypes about them. Like, yeah. like, if, like for example, if someone wants to ask me, oh, so tell me, you know, where were you born? Uh, where are you from? Like immediately I'm thinking, they think I am a foreigner. I don't want to even go there. I don't want to open up because I don't want to open myself up to being stereotyped, right? So, so that, that also prevents conversation. Maybe I do want to tell a story, but only knowing that the person I'm telling is not gonna, you know, Think, that, think of me just as that, you know, that, that film portrayal of a foreign Asian, right? right, right. Um, so I think it, it's not just that openness to story, because I think that there is openness to story, but whether people want to tell it, because there's just so much, um, let's call it like, just microaggressions that feels like, that, that comes from, I think, the Hollywood representations of, of, of us as stereotypes, so. Great, thanks, Nancy. Here's another question for us. What are practical ways to rectify these issues? Do white audiences prefer majority culture movies? If so, are there ways to financially incentivize making these decisions that will hurt the bottom line? Hmm. I think that um, that's a myth that white audiences only prefer majority culture movies. If you look at Rogue One, anyone see Rogue One, Star Wars story? So that was, um, I think, 
not a majority culture movie. You see uh, all the rebels, were, like basically besides Felicity Jones, 100% um, people of color. And, and that movie was the top box office hit of 2016. So I think that, and, and actually statistics show that Fresh Off the Boat have, I think, a very high white audience. So, because if it was only, only Asian audiences were tuning in, that show probably you know, wouldn't float. So, so uh, I think that that's-, that's funny. Oh, did I? that was totally <laughs> unintended. <laughs> I, mean, I just think poetically. Anyway, <laughs> or, or corn, very corny. Um, anyway, so, um, but I think that, that now, now I'm like totally <laughs> distracted. Because <laughs> I didn't mean that to be a joke, right? Okay, so you guys are laughing at me, not with me. No. <laughs> it's with, I promise. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, yeah, so I think that that's a myth. That's a total myth, right? That, I mean, I would imagine that, it, like, who's, Who's seen uh, Master of None here? Like that's a that's a really funny show, right? Yeah, it is. Um, and I think that there are, there are, and and you know Orange is a New Black. That there's all these shows that actually Orange is the, New, was, is the New Black was the biggest hit in Netflix, right? It's like all women, you know, and major, majority of them were people of color, and so and that was their biggest hit. Um, mm -hmm. That that I mean they don't really release numbers because they're kind of secretive like that, but. Um, but, but one time they said that, you know, that the most, the most whatever clicked, you know, because they actually know, right? They know when you are watching something, which is kind of creepy. But, um, <laughs> but Netflix, like, they said that Orange is the New Black was their biggest show over House of Cards, right? Mm. So, so you would think that like, if it was about majority culture, it should be the Kevin Spacey thing, right? With, and that show's not very diverse um, versus um, Orange is the New Black. So I think that that's a, that's a myth. And, and you look at Hidden Figures. Anyone see Hidden Figures? Like, that was a really great film, and that actually, in the two opening weekends, it actually beat out Rogue One those two weekends. Okay. So you have Rogue One, which is already diverse, and then you have Hidden Figures, which is about three black women, you know? Yeah. And so, and so, and I was at a Girl Scout event that was, uh, that was um, a screening of um, Hidden Figures. Oh, so cool. I took my girls, we were at a Girl Scout event, and the audience, most of the audience was, it was kind of an expensive event, and most of the audience was, were white Girl Scouts. And we were like, we, were cla we clapped at least like five times throughout the film, because um, we identified, right? The girls yeah. identify with that. So, so I don't think that majority culture thing is actually um, uh, holds water. No. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that was a good one, okay. Well, let's go to the next one. Is that okay? Yes. Here we go. <laughs> From what Dr. Yoon has said, I think I can understand how the media can poison people's view of the world. But how would you say we as Christians should experience and consume the media, if at all? Mm, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think that, <laughs> I, think that um, I don't think that Christians should abstain from media, mm -hmm. but I think that, um, that we should, I mean, as a, as a person who studies pop culture, I like to know um, kind of what the world is that we live in, not necessarily to be influenced in a, in a you know, negative way, but I think that that's why we need to bring our critical lens, right? So the critical lens as Christians, not, not just including like, oh, you know, they're cursing or you know, <laughs> things like that, but right. critical lens and how are God's people being represented, yeah. right? How are, how, how, and how can that impact the way I, I, I interact with people? Yeah. So what I'm talking about sounds like, oh, race, gender stuff, but that's Christian stuff. That, is, that yeah. is living as people who are reaching out to our neighbors, right? We're called to love our neighbors. We're called to understand our neighbors, you know, not necessarily become them, right, if, it, if it's a matter of, you know, b belief, but I think that we need to understand that um, the, the kind of culture that they're living in and the, and the struggles that people have. Not that media is the only way to do that, and certainly we should be doing that in, in real life, right. but I think that the media does, um, it captures you know, a, a zeitgeist of, of our country, and, and I think that it's important to, to read it critically, but to still engage. Great. Here's one more question for us. What would be a good action step to create more equality in the Hollywood industry, especially for us as college students? Okay, so I think that in, in the last chapter of my book, I, I give um, uh, examples and um, as well as I list advocacy media, advocacy organizations that you can actually join um, that, that actually do, um, do organize um, things in terms of boycotts, protests, but also you guys should support 
projects that you think are, you know, are, are good representations mm. of, of, of you know, our, our, our multicultural society. So you should go the first two, if not the opening weekend, the second opening weekend, because Hollywood actually looks at those numbers. And if those num that's why, you know, the whole like, oh, Ro you know, the, the, all over social media was like, hidden figures beats out Rogue One, you know? And they were blasting that because they want Hollywood to know, hey, there's a market for this film. Make more films like this, right? So I was actually, so the, that Girl Scout event was the second week. So I was, I, my, my family and I, we were part of those numbers, right? Yeah. So, so, so that's something that's really easy to do, right? In terms of supporting. But you could also protest. Uh, you could boycott, you could, uh, you could, you could, you know, pick it if you want. Um, that, that happened actually recently with another film um, that I know of um, that actually then, it, it didn't do very well because of the picketing. Um, but I think that also social media, if you guys are on social media, on Twitter, um, if, you're, if, you, if you even have a problem with like a television show, like a representation, there was um, How I Met Your Mother, they, they had an episode where they dressed up like as Chinese people, like, really badly and yeah. and and there was a hashtag how i met your racism so that was out and and it got an apology from from the from the producer and directors yeah so right. so i i don't know i don't i mean the show ended but but the idea is that you want them to know you know and they're watching Twitter, they're watching social media, they're actually very concerned. They think that social media, they're, they're not sure about social media, but social media can, dis can destroy a film, actually, if, if it's yeah. bad enough. So Great. those are ways that you can do that. Great. Nancy, you know, we ask one last question to all of our guests, and that is, what are some of the biblical principles that help shape some of your ideas today? So, um, so I knew this question beforehand, and I was telling Mike that this is like, this is the hardest question for me because, um, for me, that everything that I do, I feel like is biblically grounded, yeah. is grounded in my faith. And uh, oftentimes I'm asked these questions and I think like I have to justify social justice as, as something biblical mm. or as something Christian or standing up for the marginalized. Like I, I, um, I wrote this article um, on um, 10 actors of color that I think can, can defy, you know, actors so, uh, Oscar so white that it can actually, they can get nominated. And actually they did get nominated. So this was before the Oscar nominations came out. But it was posted to the Biola website and, and I was accused of being a race baiter and I was like, race baiter? You know, it's the, it's the idea that because I'm talking about race, I'm creating racism. And in my mind, that's kind of like accusing um, a firefighter of being an arsonist, right? So the fire is there, right? right? Am I going to put it out? Am I going to call it out and put it out? <laughs> or are you going to say, like, there's no fire? You're making the fire exist by, by calling it out. Yeah. So, so I feel like that's how I feel about racism, you know, because as a social scientist, it's not just like I'm whining or I'm, I'm, call, you know, I'm, I'm listening to people who are whining, but there's statistics. Like social science, is, it's a science, right? We, we use demographic um, information. We use statistics to show that there is inequality controlling for everything else, right? It's not a matter of, oh, if someone's just lazy, they just work harder. It isn't about that. It really is. There, it really, inequality exists. It is an absolute fact, right? And so for people to, to see that as somehow politicized, which is just strange to me, right? This is, this is, a, this is a faith issue. This is a, this is a Christian compassion issue. Yeah. And, and so I feel like um, in um, Jesus, you know, it's modeling after, I like to say that, you know, what would Jesus do? But I think what would Jesus do when I was growing up as a, as a middle school Christian, that was about like, don't, don't do these things, right? But as an adult, I think like, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus' ministry was, was with the marginalized, yeah. right? He, he, he reached out to the people that nobody wanted to touch, right? The untouchables. And I feel like that, that, that's my calling. Um, and that's why sociology was just such a great fit for me. Great. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're, you're like giving me that oh, yeah. time to Is wrap this it the, up. Is the music at the end of the Oscar <laughs> speech? I kind of, so. Well, anyway, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for being here. Appreciate your time. Everyone, let's give Nancy a hand one more time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.